The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 16. We're looking at verses 13 through 19. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked, Aratio in the Greek, he asked his disciples. That's a, a deep, probing, intense examination of the heart and the intents of men. Jesus asked his disciples, saying, Whom? Do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What are people saying about me, in other words? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one, the son of the living God, the source of life God, the very essence of life God, the, the supreme, divine, true God, the one who has no equal. Simon Peter said, You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. And this is where we need to be, people. We need to be in a place wherein God is revealing some things to us. It didn't come from your flesh. But we need insight. It is apocalypsis. It is an unveiling. Illumination. We need insight from God. Illumination. From God, we need direction from God. Anybody here, you're a witness. You need some direction from God. You need insight from God. You need illumination from God. We need direction from God. And you don't be, need to be looking at no crystal ball and talking to no psychics and trying to read your horoscope. We need insight that can only come from God, and all that other stuff is demonic. I got to, I got to do my horoscope every day. And you're peeping into the eyes of Satan not the eyes of God. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, identifying clearly that our God rules and reigns in heaven. And I say unto thee, this is, this is who you are, thou art Peter, in the Greek you are Petros, meaning a stone, you are a fragment of the rock, you are a loose rock, you ain't the rock. Not the rock of salvation. You spoke a truth that my father revealed to you, but upon this rock, the rock of revelation knowledge, the, the rock of truth, absolute truth, God truth, Jesus says, I will build my church. In other words, I'm going to edify. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the architect of, of this thing. I'm the builder of this thing. I'm the engineer of this thing, the engineer of this thing. I will build my church. It's my church. It ain't your church. I want everybody on notice today. You don't own God's stuff. You don't own God's people. We ain't got no people. And we have our hands full just trying to keep our own stinking flesh under control and in alignment with God. Jesus says, I'm the owner and I will build it. I will build my church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the whole company of the redeemed, that community of believers. I'm going to build that. So let me repeat, everything that comes under the guise of church ain't church. And Jesus Christ is not the head of all of these organizations and all of these buildings. He's the head of his body, the ecclesia, the church, but he ain't the head of everything that we call church. Otherwise, listen, we wouldn't see all this the sin, the, the parading of flesh that we see in these other entities if Jesus Christ is really the head of the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The devil ain't got nothing on me, and he cannot overthrow me. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you the authority. I'm going to give you the access. I'm going to give you the principles that you need in order to function in the body and administrate in the body. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose 
on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We're currently in a study that comes under the umbrella of ecclesiology. It is the study of God's church on God's terms. Please understand, not church on your terms. This is lesson number seven. We're in the continuing series, The Power of the Church. We started a new series extracted from the theme that God gave us this year. He has not changed his mind. God first. And the question for us today is, is God really first? Is he first in me? Does he have preeminence in my heart, preeminence in my life? Is God first? Before I do anything else, is God first? Is God more important to me than anyone or anything? Is God first? And when I open my eyes, when he allows me to to awaken on a brand new day, a day I've never seen before, a day I'll never see again, when I open my eyes, do I have enough sense to acknowledge God first? You woke me up this morning. You gave me soundness of mind and you gave me health and strength in my body. You gave me enough sense to say good morning, Jesus. Is he first? And the focus for this year has not changed. And I understand it. I look around and it, it is so surreal to me that this world has changed in ways that I never even imagined. And then I begin to question, is it that the world has really changed or am I just witnessing what has always been there? What is just front and center now like never before? Is it that? Then I I reflect upon the number of days remaining in this year, and it seems like this year has gone so quickly, and 74 days remaining, and I look to God. I've done this throughout the pandemic. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And then the question is, from whence cometh my help? Where do I get help? Can't nobody help us but God. Nobody. I know that we, we thought our bank accounts could do it, and perhaps... Our employment could do it, and our own human ingenuity could do it, but I, I, I want to say to us all today that God is the only one who can help us. It is clear from our text that the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, was not built on Peter, the apostle. God's church is built on truth, absolute truth, revelation knowledge, the person of Jesus the Christ. God has identified himself to us as the El Elyon, as the the most high God, the God who is strong, the God who is sovereign, the God who is supreme. He identifies himself very clearly in the scripture, and he has given us this word that the most powerful organism on the face of the earth is the church. The most powerful organism in this fallen world is the church. I want to remind us again that Christ is the builder of the body. The builder of this temple, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and he lives on the inside of me if you're born again. And if you're not born again, I would encourage you to be born again. He is the builder of his church. This is some time ago. It's been over 24 years ago. We started Time of Celebration Ministries Church with 13 people. And we had a little storefront location, 1421 Preston. The conditions surrounding this building, deplorable. Homeless people everywhere, but that's why we went, because we wanted to reach the lost. My son, Jerry Jr., our son, the baby boy, he was nine years old at the time. And I had relatives who would not even come into that area because they were so afraid. We invited uh, my little niece, Tiffany, uh, his cousin, to come and visit Time of Celebration Ministries. Out of the mouth of a child, he said to Tiffany as we drove up to the, the building, he says to her, don't be worried about what it looks like on the outside. Just wait till you get on the inside. It was a nine-year-old. She's been a member ever since because something happened on the inside. I want you to hear this, people. When people step into the local church, that community of believers, something should happen to them on the inside. And it is unfortunate that we have been parading flesh and we have been playing games to the degree we're in. People come in in a mess and they leave a mess. 
But true to God's nature, the church that Jesus is calling for and the church that he builds, when people step in, something should happen on the inside that transforms their lives forever. Jesus Christ proclaims the establishment of the church on truth, and he defines and he empowers the church. And the purpose of our series for the past several weeks, and we, we're not backing down, we're going through it, one bullet at a time, to teach the sincere seeker of truth. And I wonder, as you're streaming in, are you a sincere seeker of truth? Do you really want to know the truth? Because truth will compel us to change. It provokes change, and truth requires change. Those of you who are seated here in the auditorium today are your sincere seeker of truth. We want to make sure that there is the proclamation of the church set before us. Jesus proclaimed the church. We've already talked about that. The birth of the church. We've already looked at it in Acts chapter 2. We'll revisit before we close out the teaching. The purpose of the church. We've ta tapped into it just a bit, but we're going to deal with it more uh, on the heel of the teaching. The power of the church is where we are right now, and we're going to deal more with the position of the church. You may not have time to do a whole lot of writing today. This is information you should already have if you've been streaming in uh, every Sunday. Now, I do understand that there are some folk who go to church once a month. This, listen, this was before the pandemic. This was before the pandemic. Some people come to church once a month and believe that they did God a favor by coming. There are those who will come once every three months. That's once a quarter. There are people who will come only Resurrection Sunday, Mother's Day, Christmas if it falls on a Sunday. Y'all understand it? I think they call them the CME uh, people. That doesn't make you a child of God. If you've been streaming and you all need to go back and look at the stats, there are not as many church folk as you thought streaming in uh, as we anticipated. But we are watching the game. And we are eager to see the sports pop off again. We are eager to get to the stadiums and the arenas, but are you eager to get to God's house? Our objective is to share the most powerful invitation ever extended to lost humanity by a sovereign God, an invitation to join the body, to join his family. Jesus said this in John 1, 12. We've already seen it. To those who received him, Jesus the Christ, it is to those that he gave the power, the exousia, the authority to become the sons of God. It's to those who received him. And I understand that not everybody is receptive. Not everybody wants to receive Christ. And this pandemic has revealed so much. I have to admit my eyes have been awakened to the number of people who were in the building, but you were never in the body. I have seen the shaking. I have seen that everything that could be shaken has been shaken. And I, I've watched people fall away and go back to drinking and drugging and to homosexuality and lesbianism and gambling. Everything that you said God delivered you from. And when God does something, he does it well and he does a complete job. So we've been in the business of suppressing something. And I understand that there are folk who can suppress what's going on on the inside. You haven't been delivered because when you're delivered, you ain't got to suppress nothing. He whom the Son hath made free is free indeed. You don't have to suppress nothing. When you're free, you're just free. And you ain't got to fake it till you make it. When you're free, you're just free. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to live holy. We're not empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues, though I believe it is a very powerful gift, a needful gift. And I believe that many in God's church are filled to the overflowing, but that's not why we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. As we saw on the day of Pentecost, we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to live a holy life, to be a living epistle. For all men to look into our lives and to see the power of God, the very presence of God, the peace of God, the hand of God. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to share our faith. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus the Christ. And so I'm empowered with great boldness and courage to share with family members and friends, colleagues and co-workers that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. And to give them a reason for why I am so hopeful and so peaceful. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. So when the devil tries to bait us and to lure us and to pull us off the cliff, 
with sin and an enticement to sin, we're able to resist him. Steadfastly, we're able to resist him. We're able to withstand trials. It's been a hard year. It's been a difficult year. And many of us, our hearts ache over those who are unemployed and those who are sick and those who have died, particularly those who have died without Christ. Understanding that the greatest tragedy that a man could ever experience is to die physically without Jesus the Christ because there's no turning back. Our eternal destiny is sealed. It is set. You don't want to die without Christ. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to withstand the trials, to take hit after hit after hit, and still we come back stronger. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to glorify God, not to glorify ourselves. Not to build a name unto ourselves or a kingdom unto ourselves. Not to oppress the people of God or rape, bleed, or fleece, or exploit, or defraud the people of God. But we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to glorify God. It's not important that they know your name or my name, but that they know his name. And that name that's above every name, the name Jesus. And I told you before, demons don't tremble at the mention of your name. They tremble at the mention of his name. And there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved other than that name. That's the name Jesus. There's something about the name Jesus. I saw you rock a little bit. Y'all streaming and you rocked a little. There's something about the name Jesus. There's power in the name Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's freedom in the name of Jesus. And there's a peace that transcends all human understanding in that name, the name Jesus. And then we have learned that the body of Christ is composed of all believers from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. And so we understand the power is in the church that Jesus builds. Not in what you built or what I attempt to build, but the church that Jesus builds. Key statement, when we are in God's family, and you're going to see this in the scripture. When I'm in the family of God, when I've taken this invitation extended to me, I've taken it seriously. When we are in God's family and are clear on our identity. And please listen to me. There are so many people today like never before struggling with their identity. You don't know who you are. But please know this, to know God. I know my creator and in knowing my creator, he causes me to know myself and to know his expectations of me. When I know him as my creator, I know myself and I understand his expectations of me. And so I'm not living within the confines of the opinions of others. When we are in God's family and are clear on our identity and our assignment. So I'm not trying to compete and compare. I'm not trying to do what you do. I'm clear on my assignment. Nothing and no one is powerful enough to touch our lives without God's permission. So if it touched me, if it hit me, God allowed it. If it touched me, if it hit me, God allowed it. And if he allowed it, he's given me grace sufficient to get through it. It is for my making. It is for my shaping. It is for my growth. It is for my development. It is for my maturity. If it hit me, God allowed it to hit me. Because nothing touches my life without my father's permission. The cost of the invitation. It's a high cost. The price, this invitation extended to us. In our objective, the, the, the cost, the price is blood. John 19, 1 through 11. When people give you an invitation to come to their wedding, they've spent a whole lot of money on that wedding ceremony. That cake you've eaten, they paid for that. All those hors d'oeuvres and all of the goodies you... Listen, everything that you're a part of, the decor, the ambiance, all of that, they paid for that. There's always a price. When an invitation is extended, there's always a price. If it's a baby shower, if it's a birthday party, there was a price. And you trump up in there. That's why it's, it is it's, it's unethical for you to trump up in there without a gift. That was a deep revelation to somebody because there was a cost. And there are a lot of people, I, I haven't figured it out, a lot, a lot of people can go to a party, a wedding, a shower, and not take a gift. I don't understand you. There was a price. Where are you taking us with this, Pastor? Because God extended to us an invitation. And it did cost him something. 
John 19, 1 through 11. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. God Almighty. The soldiers wove a, a, a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. It's a New Living Translation. Hell, they made mockery. King of the Jews. They mocked as they slapped him across the face. Now, you can't take nobody mocking you. People talk about you, you're going to leave the church. You don't get a position, you leave the church. Somebody look at you funny, you leave the church. You can't lead the song, you leave the church. You can't get up in that, that pulpit and preach, you leave the church. What does it take for you to take a stand? And nobody better not slap you. And they mocked as they slapped him across the face. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I, I, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. You see, he, he, he bore no sin. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. So he died for us as us to save us. We understand this. He was not guilty. There was no fault in him. We can't say that of ourselves. We got a whole lot of fault, don't we? We came in here jacked up. We're streaming in jacked up. He wasn't jacked up. He wasn't messed up, but he was hung up for our hangups. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, look. Here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Now, how hard, how evil could your heart be? Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. Now, you got to see Pilate as the government. I want to say something to you. See, the government, when they look at the church, they ought to be able to say those people are not guilty. Those people have no fault. We ain't got nothing on those people. But can the government say that about the church? Now, I asked God a question. I said, Father, why am I able to see some stuff that these people can't see? Why can't these politicians and these governors, why can't these, these leaders, these people in authority, why can't they see? Why can't they see? Number one, if God doesn't show it to you, you can't see it. But God spoke this to my heart so clearly. He said, your heart has not been bought with bribes and money. He says that the money will blind you, the bribe, and it's all throughout Proverbs, the bribes will, will, will blind you. You start taking money under the table, you'll be amazed at the stuff you'll do when money is involved. And you'll never be able to see as long as people can buy you, as long as you take a bribe and money under the table, you'll never be able to see what God wants you to see. You keep yourself free. You, listen. When God is your source, you ain't got to kiss up to nobody, lick up to nobody, run behind nobody. When God is your source, you better believe it. God can take better care of you than anybody. And if folk push you up there, they're the same folk who will bring you down. That's why you want God to exalt you. He made it clear. You exalt yourself, I'll bring you down. I'll abase you. But if you abase yourself, I will exalt you. I'll do it in due time. I'll do it in my own time. Just... Don't you exalt yourself. I just need to say this, guys. You're, you're, you're most like Satan when you're filled with pride. Pride blinds, doesn't it? You can't see nothing. Let me say it like this. You can't see squat. The Jewish leaders replied, by law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. Well, he just called himself who he is. Can you see it? When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. Well, I would think so. And he took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Why don't you answer me? Pilate demanded, don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Now, I'm just proving a point that I, I spoke on a couple of weeks back that more powerful then the federal government is God. And then Jesus said, you would have no power, no power over me at all, unless it were given to you from above. 
So what you doing? My daddy allowed you to do that. Because y'all couldn't do none of this. But for my father giving you permission to do it. You see, if it hit me, if it touched me, God had to give it permission. Because remember this, the devil has boundaries. He cannot do whatever he wants to do. He is on a tight leash. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Wisdom, you all listen, refrain from any attempts to explain to people who you are. Don't try. You, know, this, you ain't got to explain nothing to nobody. Now, this is the, this is the deal. You got to know who you are. You have to be so sure and so grounded in your identity in Christ until you don't have to explain yourself to nobody. Now, understand this. It is going to attract some persecution. You're not going to have very many friends. You're not going to be popular. Folk are going to dislike you. And they'll cut you off. And that's all right because you're really serving, listen, an audience of one. You're seeking an audience of one. You want to please an audience of one. As long as you please God, listen, don't worry about the rest of it. Refrain from any attempts to explain to people who you are when God has his hand on your life. Simply live out the truth so that God is glorified. Fulfill your assignment. Stay focused. And it is my prayer that this teaching will awaken us since we have been called a non essential group of folk. It is my prayer that this teaching will awaken us to the reality of the body of Christ, the need for the body of Christ, and just how powerful the church. I'm not talking an organization, I'm saying the organism, the body of Christ really is. And could it be that our church buildings have been filled with broken people, not born again people? You can come to Jesus Christ broken, but I know this about the power of God. I've experienced it for myself. The power of God will heal broken people. Yes. And when you walk with Christ and you're grounded in your, in your identity in him, you cannot remain broken. Not when you're hooked up to the source of life and you're empowered by the source of life and you're rooted and grounded in the source of life and you're given the authority to reign over the circumstances of life. When I live in Christ Jesus, I rise above all of that brokenness. That's just my testimony. I'm not still broken. But the, the, the building filled with a bunch of broken people will find itself impotent. You're powerless. And God is a master at mending and healing and making whole broken people. Human behavior does not change without the power of God. You pass whatever law you want to pass. You can say this is legal. Listen, people were sinning before you made it legal. We don't need a law to sin against God. We don't need anybody's permission to sin against God. That's what, that, that, that sin nature in all of us that we come here with, that's what we do. We come here sinning. So you don't need to legalize sin for us. We came here doing that. We need the power of God to transform us so that we don't want to sin against God. I don't want to be sexually immoral so I get pregnant and then I'm in a situation where I'm, I'm trying to, to decide whether or not to have an abortion. I ain't going to ever have an abortion because I'm never going to be out of order sexually. And I'm not confused in my sexuality. God made me a woman, all day a woman. My husband is the male man. Not the one that delivers your mail. The, the male, the male, M-A-L-E, male, man. I don't have no business looking at a female. I don't care how attractive a woman is, she ain't that attractive to me. And she can be cute, and I encourage you to be cute. I encourage you to do something with yourself. Y'all missed that part. That's real deep revelation. You ain't that cute. Human behavior does not change without the power of God. We're not chosen by God to be people pleasers. We're chosen by God to be God pleasers. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 through 8. We please God. We're talking about the real church, right? We're talking about the real church. We're talking about the kind of church where a demon is afraid when a demon sees you coming. I hope I say this correctly. The demon ought to say, oh, snap, they just got up. I need, young people, I need some young people to tell me if I said that correctly. My children said, Mama, just talk like you normally talk. Don't, try to, don't use none of our words. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 through 8, English Standard Version. But, but just, we're getting to the B part, but just as we have been approved by God to be, listen, entrusted 
with the gospel. That's our message. You ain't got to conjure up not, nothing or copy nothing. And if we're like John the Baptist and we say the same thing, what is the gospel, the good news? What is that? That Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day, he got up out of the grave. He ascended into heaven. He seated on the right-hand side of God. There he ever liveth to make intercession for the church, and he's coming back again for us. That's the gospel. And if that's all we ever preach, that's sufficient. The anointing is upon the gospel. I want you all to understand this. The government is not necessarily a corrupt thing, but the people in the government. It's just like pastors. People, I ain't even know what the pastor did. I ain't going to church because the pastor did it. Listen, the office of the pastorate is not a corrupt office. But everybody in the office has not been called by God. And so you can find corruption there, but it doesn't mean the office is corrupt. You just ran into a hireling, not a shepherd. But just as we have been approved by God, approved by God, not a man, approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not to please man. And you all listen, over 24 years, I'm telling you, I have a lot of people upset with me. I don't care. I was obeying my father. I was carrying out my assignment. I don't, I don't make excuses for doing what God qualified me to do, called me to do, anointed me to do, gifted me to do, gave me grace to do. I ain't apologizing for that. I thank God for the honor. I get the privilege to do what he called me to do. So I'm not going to apologize for that. Now, you're looking to please God, not to please man. But to please God, who tests, look at this, God tests our hearts. Can you see it? And, and let me say this, you couldn't do enough to please people anyway. You will go crazy, you will lose your mind trying to please folk and satisfy folk and make people happy. You can't, do, you can't make people happy. Verse 5, for we never came with words of flattery. You better not do it. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. Don't be in it for the money, what you can get out of it. God is witness. Nor did we see glory from people. You Listen, all that Facebook stuff, that stuff is dangerous. That stuff will swell your head and cause you to think that you are a God and you are a mere person. And you will die like a mere person. Don't get caught up in the flattery. You all listen to that. You ain't nothing. <laughs> Come on, y'all. The Bible says we're but dust. Whisper fall. Nor did we see glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. We did have a position wherein we could have exerted some degree of authority over you, right? But we were gentle among you. This is the way we should be. Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, so affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you had become very dear to us. God has chosen and empowered his church to reflect his character, his gentleness, his integrity in a sinful world. As we are the stewards over the works of his hands, we own nothing. Are you all with me? So the sin issue has to be dealt with by God through the blood of Jesus Christ and the commission that he has given the body of Christ, the ecclesia. Now, you're not going to be very effective dealing with the sin issue if you are sinning. Remember, Jesus said, come ye from among them and, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And he said, touch not the unclean thing. And he says, I will receive you. I'll be your God. You'll be my children. But you can't teach against something that you're actively participating in. The sin issue must be dealt with by God through the blood of his son and the commission given to his body, the ecclesia, the church. Remember, sin is rebellion against God. And all sin causes erosion. Sin kills. Sin destroys. Sin takes you down. It will destroy the quality of your life, but also the quantity of your life as well. So our days are, are cut short, and Ecclesiastes says, says it. When you're wicked like that, you'll die before your time. You all still here? Did y'all leave and go home? 
point of emphasis, remember, God's kingdom cannot, it will not be shaken. And he alone examines and he cleanses the human heart. Just think about your own life and things that you used to do that you don't do anymore, that you don't want to do anymore, that are repulsive to you. It offends you, just the thought of it. That's in your past. Everybody has a past. That, that, was, your, that was your testimony. That was your story. Been there, done that. But you don't do that anymore. What happened to you? What happened to me? God purified our hearts. He cleansed the human heart. He transformed us by the power of his word. And only God can do that. Only God can do that. He called us the ecclesia. We've given you the definition of ecclesia, the church. We've talked about that. Now, I want to make a statement, and then we're going to Acts chapter 12, and I'll have to close. I understand all about the assembly, the community of believers, the saints, the sons, and the daughters of God. And I've stated this. I'll be the first to say that the body of Christ is not a brick-and-mortar building but a congregation of all believers in Jesus Christ called out of every tribe and every nation. And yet, the body of Christ needs assembly in a building. We must find ourselves coming together, assembling ourselves together. And God told us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. There's power in us coming together collectively. There's a corporate gift of grace that we're able to tap into when the body of Christ comes together. We need to assemble ourselves together. You have the point of emphasis, the body of Christ is not a building, but those in the body desire to be in the building. And I, I understand it today, it is unfortunate. There are people afraid. Even though with Houston, um, Dr. Thomas, I believe in Harris County, we're at 5% or so, positivity rate, and people are scared. There's panic and there's dread and there's fear and it's so unfortunate because you get to the grocery store, don't you? Wherever else you need to go, you get there. You ain't going to catch nothing up in here. I have been in this one spot since this pandemic popped off every Sunday this year with the exception of Mother's Day Sunday and that was because I couldn't get here. But every Sunday without fail, I've been here. So understand this now, and I, I know that there, there, there are guidelines and we're following the guidelines, but if I'm going to die, I'm going to die serving Christ. Amen. I'm going to do a good job of it, and I'm going to do it with excellence. Oh, see that, see that, I knew that, I knew that. Listen, I, I'll be here. I'll be here, should Jesus tear. I'll be right here carrying out my assignment because I can't die till I finish. And he ain't finished with me yet because I've got a whole lot to say that a lot of people are too coward to say. And I'm going to keep on crying loud, and I'm going to spare not. Amen. Thus saith the Spirit of God. People really are less committed. They're less committed to things that they attend often. The less you go up in there, the less committed you are. That's just the truth. Power of the church. The church is God-ordained. I want to show us this in Acts, and then I'll have to close. Acts chapter 12. And, and you all have this in your notes already. No, no, don't get offended and stop streaming. Are you talking about me? Yeah, I'm scared. I'm shaking. Listen. Your, your confidence has to be in the, the, the spirit of God, the power of God to keep you. I'm not saying that we don't have challenges, and I don't, I'm not saying that we don't feel fear. I have felt fear. I have felt panic. I have felt dread. But I choose to put my confidence in God. There are people getting killed in drive-by shootings. Yeah. There are people who went to the hospital one way, they didn't come out, and they didn't have COVID-19. The greatest tragedy is for you to die without Christ. The church, and we can put this on the screen. Don't try to write it down. I've got to go through, through it real fast. The church, the power of the church is realized in this reality that the church is God-ordained, God-built. Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my church. I will build it. That's power in and of itself. Anything that God builds and he's invested in, he's deposited in. It will show forth his glory, and God will flaunt his excellence through his body, his church, the church he builds. The church is Holy Spirit-empowered. 
and indwelt. We've already seen this. I'm filled with all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in the person of the Holy Spirit. Who lives on the inside of me and who keeps me and who guides me and sustains me and provides for me, who quickens me and causes me to be alive to the things of God, the Holy Spirit? Who reveals truth to me? The Holy Spirit. He's the restraining element. When you want to lie, he'll keep you from lying. When you think about stealing, he'll keep you from stealing. And remember, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Again, we're most like him when we're bound by this pride and we're most like him when we're bound by gossip because he's the accuser of the brethren. Watch your tongue. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. The church is authorized to declare the truth of God's word. And you can find people pick up the Bible. I'm, I'm, listen, you can walk over to a church and hold up a Bible. You ain't got no power to be holding up that Bible. You don't know what's in it. You may know the letter of it, but you don't know the spirit of it. And there are a lot of people, you got the letter, but you don't have the spirit of it. The Holy Spirit, the seal of God, the sanction of God. The church is God's legal agency through which heaven's plans are carried out on the earth. Let thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. However, God, you predetermined, prearranged, preordained, whatever it is, let it be so in this earth even as it is in heaven. The church does that. The church has been purchased by the blood of Jesus the Christ. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The gates of hell cannot, shall not, will not. It is not possible to overthrow God's church. Colossians 2.15 says that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He disarmed them. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it on Calvary's cross. He made a tremendous statement to hell. And when he got up, he shamed the devil. Because the devil, death, the grave is not powerful enough to hold him down. How are you going to hold God down? He's Emmanuel, is he? He's God with us. The keys of the kingdom of heaven belong to the church. And there are a whole lot of folk in the building. You ain't got the key. You ain't got no authority. You have no insight. You don't live by principle. And we should be people of principle. Not people who are petty. Petty people are powerless people. I want you to understand it. Anytime you find people who are just downright petty, they're just downright powerless. The keys of the kingdom of heaven belong to the church. And then the church is empowered by God to bring his rule, his rulership, into the earth. He entrusted to man. He entrusted the earth to man. Let's close with the power we see in the church. Acts 12, 1 through 12. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. I share with my husband, this generation of young people, listen, you're getting shot and stabbed over a $20 bill, over a can of beer. There's a cause so much greater that people were willing to die for this cause, the cause of Christ, bearing up this name, the name Jesus. They were not ashamed to suffer for this name. These people were persecuted because they were believers. And then Herod, Agrippa, he had the apostles James, John's brother, you remember James and John, the sons of Zebedee, right? And James was killed with the sword. You see, we may have to die for what we say we believe. Are you willing? When Herod saw how much this pleased, listen, please the Jewish people, there's always somebody excited over your downfall, excited over your misfortune, excited. Listen, when their heart chips for you, there's somebody that gets excited about it. They gloat in it. Don't you even worry about that. God's, listen, God's got you. When Herod saw how, how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. Well, let me go get him. Petros, he's supposed to be the, the little stone, right? This took place during the Passover celebration. Y'all know this is a different Peter because y'all remember this was the Peter who was cussing and he would chop your ear off. This is a different Peter. That's what happens when the Holy Ghost comes on the inside. He arrested him. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. I believe that like 16 guards got the one man. Herod intended to bring Peter out for a public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, 
Oh, God Almighty, you got to see it. The church prayed very earnestly for him. I'm talking a praying church. Now I'm talking when you got communion with God and you're filled with his spirit. Koinonia, you're in a partnership with him. The church of Jesus Christ was praying. I believe when the church is really on one accord and when the church is praying, God is moving. I believe and I pray for the day if anything would happen to me. I pray that I have a church who will pray so fervently until you could pray me out of it. If it's a sickness, if it's a disease, if I'm arrested for the the cause of preaching the gospel, the truth. I pray that there's a church who could pray me out. Pray me out of prison. Pray me out of sickness. Pray me out of disease. Pray me out of it. Pray me out of it. The church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, saints, this is what you do during COVID-19. You go to sleep. You sleep, you rest, you don't worry. This is what you do when you get laid off. This is what you do. When government is chaotic and corrupt, this is what you do, you pray. When your young black boys are out at night at 11 and 12 o'clock, you gotta go to sleep, you talk to God about it, and you gotta go to sleep. Most black mothers and grandmothers have experienced this, God protect my black boy. Don't, don't, don't let him, listen, if he gets stopped, listen, God, don't let him get a bullet in his head saying that he was resisting arrest. Don't let him get shot 12, 13 times saying that he was resisting arrest. The issue is, is that he's black. It's the black male seed. I don't know about you all, but I said I felt fear. But all I can do is trust God from whence cometh my help. He was asleep. That's what you do. You go to sleep. He's fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. This had to be a bad Peter. They got guards everywhere. Suddenly there was a a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side. Now I want you all to know the church prayed this. To awaken him and said, quick. Now all this stuff going on, the angel got to strike you, wake you up. He's sleeping. He's at peace. Get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did it. Why? Because God had work for him to do. God wasn't finished with him. Remember, Herod's mindset was to kill him too. Peter did what the angel told him to do. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and the second guard post, and everybody still sleep, y'all. Nobody woke up. God knows how to put you to sleep, and he'll, listen, he'll let you wake up when he say wake up. And came to the iron gate leading to the city, and this opened for them all by itself. Now, gates are opening. There ain't nobody opening the gate. So they passed through. I want you to, to see the power of God and understand this, folk. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the Lord, immutable. He changes not. He still possesses this kind of power because he is omnipotent. He's all-powerful God. So they passed through and started walking down the street. Then the angel suddenly left him. God knows how to lead you safely to safety. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from the hand, saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. Come on, can you see it? What you got planned for me? (laughs) What you got planned for me? God's in control of our lives. And when he realized this, he went to the home. Now, this is where they had to congregate you all. They didn't have buildings like we have. They had house churches. They went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where they were gathered. What were they doing? They were not gossiping. They weren't running people down. What, were they, what was the church doing? And what should the church be doing right now? In the midst of national, international turmoil and unrest, when there is police brutality, right? Systemic racism and so many other disparities. An economy that's in trouble. A White House in trouble. 
God's not calling for the government to make the difference. He's calling for his body. He's calling for his church. What's the first thing we do? We must be born again. We accept this wonderful invitation that he has extended to us. We enter into his family and we allow him to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And we find ourselves praying for this nation, not, not for evil, listen, but for good because God says that when good happens to the nation, good happens for you. And for the church, you, you, you pray because you want to live a life of peace and quiet. You want to be able to occupy until I come. So you need to be praying for the government, not cursing the government. Are we all understanding this? There are things that, that, that I pray, I feel compelled to pray. And I have to ask God because remember that's where our help comes from. You expose and you reveal and you block and you thwart. Every scheme and strategy of the enemy to hijack this election, to intervene or interfere in this election. The, the church has to know how to pray. Jesus said, you pray for the kings. You pray for those who are in authority. You pray for them. Understanding it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Even the most vile in government, Jesus Christ shed his blood to save. Though they may never be born again. But the thing you don't play with is your salvation. <laughs>